That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And tonight we're here to talk about William Friedkin's Cruising, which was just released on Blu-ray, courtesy of Arrow Video this month. And um, it was your first time seeing it. Was not I was only two time. years old when this movie came out. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is like requisite viewing. Yes, um, yes. Uh, I, I'd say that, you know there's there's significant cultural impact uh, with this film for sure for probably all the wrong reasons. But so it stars Al Pacino. Mm -hmm. uh, the premise of the story is there are a series of murders being committed within the gay community. Um, all of the victims look similarly, so in, I guess the idea is that there may be a serial killer on the loose. So in, in New York City. In New York City. So a cop is enlisted to go undercover to try to flush out the killer. Yep. And Al Pacino is that cop. Hired by, or uh, chosen by, Paul Sorvino. Right. So, um, I can imagine back then it was a big deal casting Al Pacino in this role. Yeah, I this, mean, is, this is after two Godfather films, Serpico, Dog Day Afternoon, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And William Friedkin is known for? Uh, William Friedkin had won an Oscar for Best Picture for French Connection in 71. Uh, Exorcist was 73. But, you know, he started the decade out with another queer classic, The Boys in the Band. Uh, which you also saw for the first time earlier, earlier this year. Yes. So it's very interesting. From 1970 to 1980, these two queer classics directed by a, a straight man. Um, are, it's interesting. Yeah. Book, bookends. So one could talk about this movie for hours and hours. Yes. There's so many um, themes and, and, the, and the symbolism and the cultural impact. Well, because obviously, the, the, you know, most people talk in reference uh, about the protests from the gay community when the film came out. So I was not super familiar with this film until Interior Leather Bar, the film. Which was directed by James Franco and Travis Matthews. So I did see that, and in my research after watching that, understood that it's based on this film. Yeah, it was a project born out of trying to recreate 45 minutes of cut and subsequently lost footage from the um, the club sequences that Pacino is at in the film. So, um, so I didn't know much. I do understand there was a lot of like backlash during the making of the film by the gay or from the gay community because this film is based on a book by Gerald Walker, who I was reading is the brother-in-law of Carly Simon. Oh, okay. Small Clouds words. in my coffee. Yeah. Um, so I don't really, I'm not familiar with the book. I don't know why people were upset about this. I'm assuming it was for good reason. Well, it's, it's you know, because the, it, it's documented in the celluloid closet as well, uh, Vito Russo's. Uh, you know, the queer representation in film was negative, and this was seen as something that was not, you know, while realistic, uh, sub a realistic subculture in the gay community was not considered something that was going to win over the hetero patriarchy by any means. So. Sure. I don't know that, well, we definitely can't discuss that here, um, but just because I think it, it, it deserves a lot more attention than we could give, but I can understand why that is. I think as a 40 year old gay man watching it in 2019, I did feel like the filmmaker handled the subject matter or the, the, you know, because I think the gay scene, like the gay leather scene in New York at that time is serving as a backdrop for this film. And I feel like that scene was handled with respect yeah, and care. I, I, but also my lens is different than, you know, a 40-year-old gay man in 1980 who grew up in the 60s and 70s. So, I mean, you know, that can be discussed at length. Well, I, 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 I mean, I think we should just focus on sort of the film as it is, like, which I think is very well done. Yeah, very well done, very eerie, uh, ambiguous, um, both in uh, its characterization of the Pacino character and who actually is the serial killer. So the story is very basic. I mean, it yeah. really is just a cop going undercover, attempting to flush out this killer, and he's not successful because we... 
I mean, so the disc has a featurette mm-hmm. featuring um, Freakin. Freakin talking about the film. And so he says that there isn't a killer. There yeah, are several there killers, are several and killers, we don't yeah. know who they are. I mean, we kind of do, but there isn't one, a single killer. Well, it, so this is, this is pre-AIDS, this film. Um, and it, it, the similarity of the progression of who, like, it's like they inherit the behavior to be a killer. It's like an emotional STD almost, I think. And I thought of, it follows uh, a few times, um, which is a very singular approach to like the spread of an STD. Uh, but that kind of mentality that this disassociation, this, uh, depersonalization is something we inherit in our behavior towards one another. Sure. That, that makes sense to me. Yeah. I was most fascinated by the, because there's a really fine balance in Al Pacino's character of whether or not he might be gay. He's initially presented as not being gay. He says he's not gay. He has a girlfriend. Played by Karen Allen. Okay, but their relationship devolves and she even says... Like, are you not turned on by me anymore? Right, like she can note a difference as he kind of delves deeper into this gay culture. Yeah, it's, it's insinuated. Several things are insinuated, but one of them that he might be enjoying it. Sure. Maybe. So I thought that was the most fascinating because... You know, ending the film, I wasn't clear, and I kind of like that, mm-hmm. that it, it's not quite clear if he's, because we also don't know, like, we, he he might be killing. Yeah. It, he also might have, you know, gay feelings, or we don't really know if, we don't see him act on them, but... Even the progression, through the progression, we see him becoming more comfortable around these men and learning the lingo and just his body. Pacino does a very good job of um, embodying this character and yeah. sort of like even his body language and his facial expressions change as he becomes more comfortable, mm-hmm. which leads me to believe that this is something that he's taking to. I really like the scene where he does poppers on the dance floor. That is a fun scene because yeah. it's kind of Cause, well because you watch him as he uh, inhales them through, on that handkerchief. Like it's really the first time you see him loosen up at all. I, to, yeah, I think like it's the only smile, time he cracks a smile. It's yeah. the only time you see him loosen yeah. up, right? That's the only time he seems yeah. kind of happy. And so, yeah, this film could be talked about endlessly, really. But I think overall, for me, it's you know requisite viewing. Mm-hmm. It really does. You know, I know at the time people felt like their community and that scene were being objectified in a negative way. But looking at it from my perspective today, I think it seems like a very appealing scene. I, I think we're I think we're really lucky that this got made. Yeah, I mean, I watching this film, I really felt like that was an era and a place that I would have loved to have enjoyed, and um, so it was really fun seeing it. Um, and I thought that it was captured in a very authentic way. I, I, I don't know. There, there, there's, it's a very simple narrative, but there, there is just a lot going on with, you know, stabbing as penetration as kind of the only real way to, you know, make an impact on some on people. And the sure. fact that it's, it's people killing mirror images of themselves. All these men look the same. That's why they think there's a, this, right. this, that's why Pacino's hired because he fits the composite of the victims. Um, and I think it's, it says a lot about um, whiteness and the upper hierarchy of queer culture and that eventually will cannibalize itself. And I think that that cycle or that suggestion was interrupted by AIDS, which, you know, really brought the community together because sure. of how it affected everyone. But yeah, I mean, all those things, you could talk about many, many yes. things. So there really isn't, this isn't the platform for that. I just think that this is, you know requisite viewing if if you're a gay person you need to watch this movie um i think it's on and and really appreciate sort of this time capsule because this you know the the subculture depicted in this film i don't think exists anymore it does but it's not as um it doesn't feel i mean you know I, i i don't frequent a lot of leather bars but the ones i have been to you know, it feels like a uh, like a fossil because mm-hmm. now with technology, people are able to meet up in more efficient ways to get what they want. 
So just seeing oh, yeah, that, that, that venue as not only a place where people can, you know, express their fetish, but also meet people. Mm -hmm. I think that's the that's the fascinating part of this film is that we actually see gay men interacting in, in an organic way and meeting. This, I mean, this subculture. I think there's a leather subculture that exists, but it's there it's is diluted. It's not the same. Well, and it's very sexual. Like it's based purely on sex. Is my understanding is you know sort of being adjacent to that community that it's my, it revolves more around sex than like fellowship. Mm -hmm. Yes. And even though that's a big part of the film is these men's like sexual endeavors, it did also feel like it is a place for them to go. And I, and I, and I really liked that. I really liked how it didn't just seem like this seedy place. And maybe it's because I'm a gay man and I'm not, you know, those topics aren't taboo to me, but no, no. but I definitely think like every gay person needs to watch this movie. <laughs> um, um, it's got a whole slew of recognizable faces. There's uh, besides Karen Allen and Paul Sorvino, Ed O'Neill, James Remar, um, young Ed O'Neill, William Rust, the dad from Boy Meets World, um, yes, Mike Starr from uh, Dumb and Dumber. Um, okay. It was photographed by James Cotner. Um, who did a really great Sylvester Stallone Rector Howard film called Nighthawks after this as cinematographer as well. You didn't love the look of the film so much. It's very monochromatic. Uh, Cotner wanted it to be black and white. Um, but I don't think this is a beautiful film. I don't think there are, there are no memorable shots, um, which is fine. I think there, there are some, like the nightclub scenes with Al Pacino are very memorable to me. But I don't think those are, nightclub scenes to me are not, that's easy. Okay, sure. But I mean, the, the stabbing sequences I think are quite. Even watching it again, are they're I, violent and jarring. Yeah, yeah, but I, I don't think this is a beautifully shot film. He, I don't know that I think it's eerie either. Uh, but he, I think it compares. Uh, strangely, I thought of Dress to Kill, the De Palma film from around the same period. You know, the one with Andy Dick. That film has a mood, though. Yeah, more than this yeah. does. But that it, he's doing something different than what Friedkin's doing here. Um, recently, uh, the Jan Gonzalez film, Knife Plus Heart, which isn't a film I love that much, but um, I could see that taking a lot from cruising the aesthetic. Uh, but Kotner also shot um, the Whitney Houston music video for The Greatest Love of All. Oh. Oh. Randomly. Um, which actually is not the best video. <laughs> Oh, so I, think I owned that video as a kid. Work. 1984, I remember buying that <laughs> video cassette. Um, well, I would give this film four out of five stars. I would give this film four and a half out of five stars, and the Arrow release four out of five stars. Great. Anything else? No, I'm no, good. No, good. All right, thanks. Thanks. Bye.